I'm Dave Reaver. For the next hour, we're going to be presenting to you on video some of the most bizarre and unbelievable things that we have ever presented through television efforts. In my lifetime, I've known some war, and in my lifetime, I have seen some of the bizarre. I've known suffering, but I've never known of the bizarre. I've never known of suffering like you're going to hear about in this video. And I certainly promise you this, it is war. I also think you should know that we accept responsibility for saying up front that what you're going to see in here is terrifying. I do not want to be responsible for allowing children in the room who are not prepared for this. Parents, please pay careful attention and do as I ask. Please don't allow children to watch this video alone. Today, we are compelled to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. As people remember these experiences, they gag, they are nauseous, they, their, their entire body remembers what it was like to be there, to see this, to participate in this, to have this done to them. It's not a game. They really believe this. They believe Satan is on their side and they will hurt you. The rituals that we went through are horrendous, they're horrifying to anyone on the outside that even dares dream that something like this could take place. The darkness of Satanism is spreading rapidly today, especially among young people. We see the graffiti symbols everywhere, the evil influences bearing down on teenagers, in the music, and in their lifestyles. The dimensions of this phenomenon have become alarming. In this metroplex, uh, it's my estimate that there's approximately 40,000 practicing Satanists in the metroplex. That does not include pagan organizations, druids, Wiccans, which are of the uh, right-hand path of witchcraft, not the left-hand path. Dabbling in the occult and its various aspects in this metroplex would have to be over 100,000 individuals. Now, that's a conservative estimate. It's not going on in the schools to hear them tell, you know, they're wearing blinders. It's hard to get them to realize it's going on. Some, some te the teachers are more cooperative because they will call if they find notes or they hear something going on they will call us. Our department is getting more involved in the last eight or nine months because we've been getting calls from people that said, we didn't know who to report these things to. There was like seven or eight large dogs, Dobermans, shepherds, that had been killed and hung in a circle, their heads cut, blood drained, and the guy said, well, that happened six months ago, but we didn't know who to report it to. 85% of the teenagers in high school in Western Europe have been exposed to hardcore Satanism. That's an unbelievable figure. Here in America, I do not believe those figures are that high, but I would venture to say that 40% uh, of the kids. Most teens involved in Satanism are dabblers, they wear the clothes, try a few rituals, and listen to the heavy metal bands. But some go further. 
of these, the self-styled Satanists can be the most dangerous. Because they never join a cult, they are unpredictable and volatile. Sean Sellers murdered a store clerk for a thrill, then his own parents. Richard Ramirez, convicted as the Night Stalker killer, worked alone in the name of Satan. It took the jury 22 days to find Richard Ramirez guilty of all 13 murders and 30 related felonies he was charged with. Ramirez declined to be present for the verdict. Thus ended the year-long trial of the Texas drifter accused of being the Night Stalker, the serial killer who once terrorized Southern California. All but one of the brutal murders took place in the summer of 85. The killer was dubbed the Night Stalker because he broke into his victims' homes and attacked them while they slept shooting, stabbing, beating them to death. In some cases, wives were raped after their husbands had been murdered. Victims were robbed, survivors forced to swear to Satan, and sometimes pentagrams, symbols of devil worship, were left behind, scrawled as their bodies. Fear spread throughout Southern California as the death toll reached 13. I'm very upset. It's frightening and I'm scared. Everybody is real edgy. We have uh, diligently tried to lock all the doors and windows. Gun sales doubled. A hunt was launched for the man in the police sketch. And Richard Ramirez was finally captured by an angry mob in an East Los Angeles Hispanic neighborhood. Who is safe? In court, Ramirez was defiant. A guard said Ramirez posted pictures of a victim in his jail cell, declaring there is blood behind the Night Stalker. Defense attorneys said Ramirez was a victim of mistaken identity, but witnesses and fingerprints tied him to the murders and ultimately sealed his conviction. Now the court will decide the fate of Ramirez, whether he's sentenced to death or life in prison. The man known as the Night Stalker has been sentenced to death in California. Richard Ramirez was convicted of killing more than a dozen people in 1985. Ramirez got his nickname because he often entered victims' homes at night, murdering people as they slept. In court today, Ramirez read a twisted and rambling statement. You don't understand me. You are not expected to. You are not capable of it. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. Legions of the night, night breed. Repeat not the errors of my father and show no mercy. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. That's it. Today's sentence means Ramirez could die in the gas chamber for his crimes, but it carries an automatic appeal. Self-styled Satanists are volatile and frightening. But what of those who join organized cults and become what is called traditional Satanists? Teenagers recruited into these cults are told of the thrills and untapped power they can achieve through Satan, and they are promised drugs and sex. But do they know what really awaits them in the end? Once they get involved with this, they don't get out because they've taken part in so many criminal offenses uh, that it, they can't just get up and walk away from it. The, they're, they're trapped by their actions and they're blackmailed into staying in. Another thing is that there's a good deal of uh, uh, power. It's an addiction. It's an addiction to evil. We all understand. Let's take it to the practical. For the public school uh, teachers and, and counselors that are watching, they understand addiction. They understand how an addiction will move from marijuana to cocaine. Uh, in my own family, we watched an addiction in, in my second son move from marijuana into a $700 a day cocaine habit that nearly killed him. He was putting IV cocaine in his arm 15, every 15 minutes during the day. And he didn't just start that way. And these people are into an addiction as well. They start by reading the Satanic Bible, start by a little candle magic. They start by the Ouija board and getting in touch with the spirit. And they become addicted to the power. There are no motion pictures that have come out that truly show what happens. They don't show the terror that is in the priest's eyes and in his mind. They don't show that same terror in the high priestess, nor in the participants. The power that is derived there. I met with a witch the other day, a high priest of the Wiccan craft, of the craft. And he found out who I had been. And he said, he said, I probably, that's a problem I've got right now. He said, I, he said, I don't have the power to go against people like who you were. He said, 
Lord, he said, you people could light bonfires and never walk up to it. And I said, that's right. And he said, you could kill me with a thought. And I said, no, with a word. Is that right? I mean, yeah. That's the power that someone who has mastered, who has become an adept in the craft. Now, we're talking about a traditional Satanist, not a non-traditional idiot that is playing at this, but somebody that has made this their life's craft. Recently, Dave interviewed Dr. Bob Sloan, a psychologist who's dealing extensively with people trying to escape the terrible after effects of satanic involvement. Each sequence is drawn by a specific person, and I think the pictures illustrate the kinds of things we're talking about. Uh, the pictures are also drawn by the patient as they try to remember and try to recall what's happened. So drawing becomes a very important part of, of getting out and, and being able to firm up the puzzle that they're trying to put together. So they draw these pictures as a part of their recovery. As you can see here, there are certain steps that are followed. It's not a random kind of uh, thing that uh, they, they carry out on a whim. There's specific steps that they follow in preparing a small child to be initiated into the cult. They have to do this in this case because the child has been chosen. Oftentimes a baby is chosen for some reason to be the next leader of the clan. In this case, uh, there was a boy who was chosen, and his mother, who herself was a child who was chosen when she was a baby, who is now grown up, now she's an adult, she has a son, she's preparing him. As you can see, the elements he's considered special, and it's the, it's the combination, the introduction of pleasure and pain. Here you can see that she is introducing pleasure at the same time while she's doing that, she's putting things, objects, uh, maybe a pencil, maybe, maybe a uh, heated nail or some other object that would create pain in him at the same time. As, the, as this awareness comes to her, she is in torment. As she, now, as she looks begins, like she's tried to, to rub it out. Yes. There's, there's a part of her that said, I don't want to say this, I don't want to admit it. There's another part of her that says, yes, it's the truth, I have done it. How could I? I am so bad, I'm so evil. My uh, night of baptism and initiation, I was initiated by fire, both physically and spiritual fire. And the spiritual fire is, they summoned a demon forth and it entered my body and set me on fire from the inside out that I might know discipline and the power of the coven. And um, I've done it myself to other people. There are horrors that are unmentionables. That's why I say movie, motion pictures can't hold a candle to it. If you will, imagine the young man that was taken off the streets of Matamoras. He would have been mutilated slowly, that his life force not leave him quickly, but slowly as to increase the frenzy of the sorcerer committing the act. So the greater the pain, the greater the suffering, the greater cries that he gave out, the greater the power derived from his life force leaving his body. That's the belief. Some of Dr. Sloan's patients also speak of the terrors of Satanism. These pictures were drawn by adults remembering things they had long ago repressed, things done to them as children when they had been forced to take part in cult rituals. The following is but one example of a Satanic sacrifice. This is a, a typical kind of ritual. Uh, which involves the kidnapping of children. And uh, in this case, you can see this ritual ceremony took place in a barn here, the bales of hay. It's an old barn. And in this case, you can see the, the cauldron, the boiling cauldron, the altar, the gold knives, all the elements are here, the, the robed members of the cult. Uh, in this case, the victim is a child, four or five years old, and uh, the, the cult victim who drew this picture was still a child. And the sacrificial victims were, in this case, two, a brother and a sister who had been kidnapped. And uh, they had been seduced. And at this point, she reports that they weren't really scared. 
They'd probably been taken off of a playground somewhere and said, we're going to go have a birthday party or something. So they weren't scared. They're brought in ages uh, about seven. You can see the cult leader here. Um, these children are tied onto the altar. And there's also the beginning of bloodletting. So they've cut the boy some. He's starting to cry, and she's crying, because they, they realize mm -hmm. now it's happening, of course, and they're screaming. It, it starts to happen. Um, the member of the cult, the child member of the cult, of course, is watching. She's very scared. She's reporting, and she's remembering that they made her do this and how bad she feels about it. But she can't help it. She's four. These are adults. She's a victim in this process. Um, as this ritual proceeds, you can see that there begins to be a lot of blood. Uh, you can see that the, the boy here is then cut open, again, along his chest, ripped apart, his organs taken out, and then he's dismembered. You can also notice that the little girl has lots of little cuts, and she's bleeding pretty profusely here from her groin area. So there's beginning to be a lot of screaming, a lot of blood, uh, dismemberment, and preparation for uh, the cannibalism. You can also pick up in this drawing the worship nature of this. Right. This is not just an event. This is a, a worship service that builds to a frenzy, builds up to a peak. Um, and this, of course, is, as this person wrote here, preparation for the human stew. Here, the brother is dismembered. He's already gone. He's in the stew. And the, the child, a uh, member of the, the cult, then herself is uh, brought up to participate more. The adult leader is cutting the, the little girl and killing her, ultimately, as the, the child uh, member um, inserts other objects into the little girl. The element that's not really seen here but written in is the uh, sexual abuse that always precedes the bloodletting. The members of the cult all sexually abuse um, the victims before the torture and the mutilation This begins. is where the power of pornography in our society begins to play its role. It's, it's the introduction of the bizarre. That, that pornography begins to be a, a venting and a letting of urges, and once it starts, it's never satisfied. And pornography is just the introduction. It's the little door to open to the mind. Well, pornography, of course, is an addiction, and pornography, sexual stimulation, it stimulates the same part of the brain, the pleasure center, that cocaine stimulates. It's addictive. Um, and, of course, sexual stimulation and the unfettered expression of sexual fantasy is a part of all no, of absolutely not anything goes the, as you know the satanic theology is the reverse of christian theology love is bad uh -huh. life hate is, is bad hate is good death is good so there's the kind of the the breaking down of any limits on fantasy and imagination and what the theology of satanism does is uh, says no holds barred and evil is Expressed. Good. Evil is good. That's their that's right. their role. There are scores of painful stories like these from people who have lived a hellish nightmare. One of Dr. Sloan's patients tells of having to watch an actual crucifixion conducted at Easter time when coven leaders kidnapped a young man, nailed him to a cross, mutilated him, branded him with irons, and then threw him alive into their bonfire. One victim tells of being forced to help in a torture and sacrifice of his own mother. I've been out now for 14 years. I've only been able to laugh, and this is a serious statement. I've only been able to laugh out loud for about 10 years now. And I'm gradually getting better about being able to laugh and have joy in my life because I hurt inside a great deal. Uh, many times I think about things that I did and what I have done to other human beings. This is not a pleasant thing at all. It's very disturbing. I know that the Lord has forgiven me, and my problem is, is can I forgive me? And I know that I have to, and that's the fact that I live with. I do, and I'm getting better at it. And I have a wonderful, wonderful wife right now who's very loving and very understanding, and who has a deep understanding of 
the occult and Satanism from what I have taught her, but an understanding from the viewpoint that a Christian should take towards it, a caring, a loving attitude. I mean, if it wasn't for that, I don't know exactly how I would ha deal with it today. You know, for years, police officers have had to deal with kids getting hooked on drugs mm -hmm. and going bad over a period of, uh, a relatively short period in the life of a child, maybe uh, three to six months, something like that. A kid can go from being a straight-A student to being a um, absolute uh, disgrace. And uh, what we find in occult groups are that a child can go from being uh, perfectly normal, well-adapted, uh, well-thought-of, to being a total um, uh, waste in, in a shorter period of time as a month. And so frequently when we get involved in these things, it's because they have gone off the deep end in such a short period of time. Have you seen some of these people come out of this? What are you seeing with some of these people now? Where are they in their development? We're seeing people uh, in the process of... Uh, we've seen a real spiritual sensitivity with these people. Uh, they know there's a spirit world. They're very sensitive to that. And they, because they're with us, they've committed themselves to, uh, to healing and uh, a change in their life. It's a long, torturous process. It is not a quick fix. How can you do this to a child? A few people that have tried to pull themselves out of a group like this are traditionally females who are tired of giving up their children for sacrifice, something like that. But traditionally, the men don't get out very often. Uh, we do see uh, situations where the uh, kids get in, but because of free sex and drugs and the power and so forth, they ended up getting in over their head, and then they can't uh, pull themselves out either. Dr. Bashir Ahmed is a psychiatrist dealing extensively with young people caught in Satanism. Here he gives a profile of the typical recruit. The kids who have difficulty at home, who are coming from dysfunctional families, where the bond between parents and children almost non-existence. These children are easily lured to the fantasy world, which they like it. They most probably like to read about magic stories, fantasies, and they begin to live in this world. And when they see an opportunity to experiment something like this, they become very impressed. For example, uh, for a 13-year-old going at midnight to a cemetery is a lot of excitement. Uh, his heart is beating very fast. He doesn't know what is going to happen. Um, he has some fear. A non-traditional Satanist uh, stem from anyone who might have a low self-esteem about themselves, someone that is an underachiever, is not an overachiever, someone who is not charismatic in their attitude. Most normally a child that is been turned off by school, been turned off by his friends. Satanists will approach him and they'll woo him in because they will become his best friend. And after they get him, he's hooked. Satan is at his most deceptive when he appears to be good. Such is the case with many of the occult practices in southern Louisiana. There, the tree tours, as they are called, are famous for their peculiar blend of magic, potions, folk remedies, and diluted elements of Roman Catholicism. We visited one tree tour who tried to explain some of his rather confused methods. The power is written in the Bible. The verses of the Bible has been given, and uh, no matter where you take, what part you take in the Bible, Jesus said that he you have given power to all. These candles are for if somebody sad, somebody have tears, and they keep hearing things in their home. The spirit is not resting. And it's very simple to, to cure someone with epilepsy. Somebody that falls in this in a, in these kind of fit, take your little needle, a needle and hold his finger and just stick it just enough to draw blood, not stick it all the way we hit bone, just enough to break the skin. 
take a little bit of that his blood and put a little sugar in water and make him drink of his own blood. Just a little bit, about nine drops of blood. New Orleans, bustling city on the Mississippi with a rich and colorful history. Famous for its lively French Quarter, jazz, unique dining, and voodoo. Though most voodoo practitioners live in the swampy backwaters of lower Louisiana, some have set up shop in the French Quarter. One of the most famous voodoo houses is owned by Chicken Man, who recently granted us an interview. He turned out to be more promoter than magician. Why do they call you the Chicken Man? Well, I'm the voodoo king of New Orleans, and uh, I do my, my voodoo rituals out in the bayou on my island. I use live chickens and live snakes. What kind of rituals do you do, or what is it supposed to do? Well, my rituals is uh, mainly I do those for healing and, and uh, helping people, not hurting. That's the main purpose. And um, I do a lot of it, use a lot of it for uh, keeping the kids off of drugs. You know, drugs is getting real bad now. Well, what kind of rituals do you do for drugs or that? Explain just some of the rituals a little bit. Well, I get pieces of seeds from the, from the bayou. And at night, we do our rituals to put all the seeds in a, lot, in, a, in a big circle. And while the drums are playing, we put energy into those seeds. And uh, I pass them out to the kids to carry in their pocket. And when they think about going on drugs, that they'll put that seed in their hand. Not all Louisiana tree tours stay with the good magic, however. Ferenberg, a pastor who continually confronts their oft-feared work, explains black magic. I have a man in the church right now that when he first started coming, this man was blackmailing him that if he didn't pay him so much a month that he was going to put hex and voodoo on him. And this man was in such fear that I literally had to tell this man to tell that man if he did it again, I was going to the DA's office. That's what I'm saying. If the people stand up and let these people know that they're, not, they're going to be exposed, this man quit blackmailing this guy when I threatened to go to the DA with it. Law enforcement officials are just now beginning to learn about cult crime and how to investigate satanic rituals. The slaughter in Matamoris helped to awaken the nation to a growing nightmare. Mount Morris is not finished. It's the beginning. It's the tip of a very, very large iceberg. And we're going to hear more of Madam Morris. And the lady that was um, taken into custody, who she claims that she had no foreknowledge of these events and she did not participate, I would venture to say she fits the exact profile of being the high priestess of this cult, as well as being the one in complete authority and in charge not the Godfather. He was under her direct command. I think that our authorities here in the state of Texas have somewhat downplayed and may have missed the boat with her. The Mexican authorities have not missed the boat. They have her keyed in exactly who she is. And it's up to the authorities here to listen to them, pay attention to what they're saying. One Mexican Mexico authority down there uh, stated that she exhibited three distinct personalities one of which is this kind, uh, sweetheart, all-American girl attitude. Another one of, that she exhibited is one that growls and bites and kicks and spits. Uh, she exhibits a third one that exhibits tremendous authority and power. That's why I say she probably is. She exhibits the type of uh, personality, uh, the type of demeanor and so forth, uh, an individual that would be in power. People don't want to believe the unbelievable. Vicki Caldwell has been investigating cult crimes for the sheriff's office in Putnam County, Florida, and during the past few months has noticed an increase in activity among satanic groups. I got arrested about four years ago because a friend of mine up in Ohio, her son got involved and he tried to kill himself and kill his parents. And so I've been studying it since I came with the department. It's been about a year and a half. I have noticed an increase around here with the teenagers. What kind of things do you see? Uh, mostly your self-styled Satanists, your dabblers, drugs, heavy metal music, role-playing games, animal mutilations. In August of 1986, we had a double murder in which two teenage Parkers were found shot quite a number of times mm -hmm. in a rural parking lot of a uh, development which was going up. At the time of that investigation, we became 
acquainted with a term called Dungeons and Dragons, and as part of that investigation, we got involved in some of the occult investigations also. Well, part of the problem, number one, they understanding what they're up against. Uh, they have pagans, witches, traditional and non-traditional Satanists, as well as uh, skaters. They have uh, skinheads, freaks, pops. They've got everything under the sun that they're not truly understanding the relationships between each and every one of them, as well as which are criminal and which are not criminal. Who's violent, who is not? Who can be expected to turn violent? Uh, someone necessarily calling themselves a Satanist isn't necessarily so. It's a, it's a new era for law enforcement, just like when drugs started, it was new. Computer crime is new. People are starting now to realize that there is something else out there. A lot of cases are being reopened because of that. Well, I've been a police officer for 15 years, and probably during that entire 15 years, I have seen things which we now label as ritualistic in nature, but never recognized it. One young woman's body was found what appeared to be a brutal rape case that culminated in the stabbing of the victim was left by law enforcement agencies that way with no further clues. However, upon her chest was Z-E-N across her chest in her own blood. It made no sense to them. It made no sense because they're not Satanist. That Z-E-N is the name of a demon and his name is not Zen, by the way. It is Zad-in, zad -in. And that demonic entity is who she was sacrificed to. And had they known that, it would have led them in the direction of searching for a Satanist. The most frightening fact of all is that Satanists today have encroached into every level of society, a dangerous and unseen force. Lawyers, politicians, uh, police officers, and this is very shocking at how many police officers, how many officials are actually practicing Satanist. And this is one of the other problems that we have in dealing with the crimes, is the crimes themselves are snuffed out. They're, they're hushed up. Or if a crime is known to be in progress, it's very difficult to get anybody to respond to it because of things that are blocked within the judicial system. By Satanists? By Satanists. These people are in every strat of society. We're talking doctors, we're talking lawyers, we're talking a lot of Christian ministers who preach a sermon perhaps on Sunday morning and are involved in satanic rituals the night before. We're talking elders and, uh, and Sunday school superintendents. I, I'm, I'm mentioning the cases that I am aware of. Uh, and as you, you've study this yourself and read the literature, you know that uh, people at every level and every profession, uh, successful business people, um, psychologists, doctors, law enforcement people, uh, are involved in this kind of thing. It's, uh, it's unnerving. We've had notes written about uh, Satan on walls in schools, you know, that my God's better than your God and all this. We had one note, you're welcome to a bloodbath ritual. I'll be there at 11.54 for the, so for the gatekeeper of hell to appear. Bring your set clothes or black sheets. This is what's going on in basically the schools. Usually, it's very secretive. As far as the kids go, you know, they don't know anything. They haven't done anything. Parents usually think, my kid just going through a, you know, a phase. Invited to a party.
In the beginning, Satanists will entice a recruit with these three promises, power, drugs, and sex. Most teenagers recruited into Satanism are boys, drawn by the violent images and rituals, and by the fear they can cause in others. Yet without heavy involvement in drugs, most of these recruits would not be able to go on. Most of the times, like I said, there's drugs involved. Just because you're taking drugs does not necessarily mean you're into Satanism. But nine times out of ten, Satanists are into drugs. I have not seen in my practice any uh, adolescent who have gone to the cult activity without using drugs. As a non-traditionalist begins to get deeper into drugs, and more and more deeper into his known craft and seeking after the powers, he loses sight of reality completely. You're no longer dealing with human beings as you and I know them. Yvonne Peterson tells this tragic story of one girl who committed a heinous crime in the name of Satan. And I think parents need to hear this, that uh, she needed somebody to talk to and her parents were too busy. She was the oldest of six, and she was their babysitter, their dishwasher, and their house cleaner. And they didn't have time for her. I'm going to call her Diane for the book, okay? And uh, that's not a real name, but she was a very intelligent, pretty little girl of 12 years old. She went to a party, and she met a young man, which we'll, we'll call him Steve, okay? He's 16. And Steve told her he would listen to her, and he would pay attention. Now, this is, this is not fiction, and this isn't something I read in a book. I sat with this little girl as she cried her eyes out, as she walked through the memories of the past two years, uh, the things that she had had done to her and had had to do to other people. Uh, he told her, I'll listen to you, and he gave her a marijuana cigarette. And they went outside and sat under the tree, and they talked. And then he began to tell her how, how pretty she was and how much he needed to be around her and how fascinating she was. And all he did was, it was show love and attention, which every teenager in America craves from their parents. And, and so if they're not yet. there, then those Satan, well, the average, age, the average time a father spends with his kids is three minutes a day. That's sad. Three minutes a day. That's incredible. And... Uh, so he told her, I'll, I'll, Steve told Diane, I'll take care of you, you know, we'll be boyfriend, girlfriend. And they developed their relationship over the next six months. He also developed her drug habit because now she was hooked on cocaine. Okay, at the end of the six months, he told her that he was a Satanist priest and that she was being recruited and that she would be initiated into his coven of, of Satanists. She kept a diary. At one point, she said, where has that innocent child gone? Will I ever know her again? Speaking of herself. Her tragic notes all throughout her diary, both of her spiritual bondage and her physical bondage to the addiction. And she said she would lay in bed at night and she would hear them chanting and calling her back to the circle. And then on August the 1st, three years ago, she was led into a cemetery. And if I might have your permission, I'd like to read from her hand the memories of that night. Uh, please do. I found out that we were having our cult ceremony in the cemetery. That wasn't as shocking as when I found out that Steve and me were going to be married into the cult. Anyway, it was fantastic. The moon was perfectly round and it wasn't even cold. By the black candles, which were primarily used for light, we went through the ceremony of eternal slavery to each other. We cut our tongues and we let the blood pour into each other's mouths. It was nirvana. We were one, one blood, one being. Rosalie passed the sacred vial around and we performed the ritual of extending ourselves. Bright colors and lightning flashed streaks through the sky. Sometimes the colors exploded like rockets on the 4th of July, both in and out of our head. When the chanting started, they brought in a little baby. He was barely walking, tied him to a nearby tomb. It was crying. After it was tied down, Chris took out his sacrificial dagger. I held back the baby's head while he cut it from the base of its neck down to its waistline and across the stomach. The baby was still alive, so I broke its neck by just about twisting it off. I hate myself so bad now. I helped in the killing of a baby. Animals made me sick enough and made me feel quite horrible. But a baby, my God, that was someone's child. I know now that I am truly horrible. No punishment I have ever had in the past could even begin to measure the type of punishment I need. I wish it could have been me they killed. My life isn't worth anything anymore. 
I've taken away someone's right to live. She's 14. And I mainlined with Satan uh, when I was 21 years of age. And I came out at age 28, but I was a Satanist high priest for four years. Now, during that particular time period, I remember very little as far as details are concerned. I don't remember even graduating from high school, although I know I did. Why don't I remember it is the fact that drugs were involved and the need to escape, the need a person has to have to escape the realities of what they have been involved in. And I took what I called clean drugs. They were pharmaceuticals. Not that it really matters any, but I was hooked on Percodan, Valiums, Librium, and just plain alcohol. I would take an average of uh, 60 to 80 milligrams of Valium in a day's time with about 40 milligrams of Percodan and wash it all down that night with two or three vodka Collins. It was a functional addict. Drugs, sex, power. These are the enticements Satanists use to lure teenagers. Another is music, specifically heavy metal or black metal. I think music has always been a powerful media all the way through. I mean, music was important to you and me, and, and it's important to the teenagers today. And we're not anti-heavy metal, but we're anti the heavy metal message that is causing death and destruction. And the symbols that they're using are so blatantly occultic uh, that it's very difficult for us to overlook that kind of thing. For instance, if we take uh, the album uh, cover from Slayer's album, Rain and Blood, uh, it depicts a message to young people that maybe consciously they don't receive, but subconsciously they're receiving this message. On the front of this album cover, uh, Satan is depicted as a goat, which is very familiar to the Satanists. They know that that would be the goat would represent Satan. And he is seated on a wooden throne. And the throne is being supported by two people. Now, in the hand of this goat is a decapitated head. And of course, we're finding decapitated bodies all over America. And um, that is a common way for a Satanist ritual to occur is to do the decapitation. And so he's holding this decapitated head, which emphasizes the bloodletting ritual and the murder. And then the throne is, is lifted up and being carried on the shoulders of two men. The man in the foreground is wearing a mitered hat, which we know to be the hat of a pope. And so that man represents organized religion or the church. Behind him is another man who is carrying the throne of Satan, not only on his shoulders, but across his neck, like the stalks would have him in bondage. Mm -hmm. And that man has horns and a forked tongue. And when you look at that, you think, oh, this is one of Satan's demons. And yet, if you look carefully, his hands are very prominent in the picture, and they have nail marks in them. And the only man depicted throughout history with nail marks is Jesus Christ. And so what this thing is saying to them is that Christ and the church will support the rise and, of Satanism and in addition to that, then there's the sea of blood that is flowing into a huge sea below Satan. That All the faces are down in the sea that he has taken captive and, and have become his victim. And the very forth, the, in the forefront, there is a face that if you take that face and put it up against the face of George Washington, you'll see that they're almost the same. I mean, they're so identical. And so what we're saying here is that Satanism is going to take over our country and that it is going to be brought in and supported by Christ himself and the organized church. That is blatant uh, evangelization and propaganda being, sh being shared with uh, thousands of young people through music. I think the greatest tool to desensitize America has been uh, media in general, whether it is television, whether it's toys, games, or whether it is music, they all have played an important part. They all carry a message, don't they? Absolutely, and of course, in the life of the teenager, the two single most factors that we see um, is music and a game called Dungeons and Dragons. And then, of course, trailing very closely behind that and vying for the position is the amount of occult information that is put out through um, the videos, the movies, the TV shows. We went into a very small store, David. This was, I mean, maybe 
as big as we're sitting here. This was a small set. We found 119 videos on the occult in one small store. And we have a video in America that is on our shelves that has been banned in 46 countries. And it was so popular, it has faces of being one, two, three, and four. And in that video, it shows everything that is gruesome, grotesque, everything that you would never want to see or hope your child would never see in the way of death scenes, including some decapitation occult rituals. Parents should be alert to the warning signs that show their kids are involved in the cults. Besides the music, there are the clothing, jewelry, and symbols used. There is the classic pentagram, worn inverted by the Satanist, the broken cross or peace sign, the inverted cross, the horn hand sign, the goat's head, the 666 sign, and many others. In addition to symbols, watch for involvement in occult games like the Ouija board or in dark role-playing games. I would tell them, especially the parents with the young people, this is not a phase. Know what your young people are, are doing. Talk to your young people. Communicate. Don't fluff it off. Check everything. There's nothing wrong with asking them where they're going, what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with checking out their music and books they're reading. The parents need to care and communicate. Satanists entrap young people in several ways. At sex parties, they take snapshots of their victims for use of blackmail, or they'll involve the unsuspecting victim in their darkest rituals, perhaps animal or human sacrifice. They will get the teenager to offer his blood or even a finger to Satan. Blackmail and even outright threats keep a teenage victim in line. Some victims see suicide as their only escape. The tragic legacy of Satanism. The message I like to give to parents is that be close to their children. Understand them. Talk to them. Communicate with them. Uh, always find a time where you will make a point to go to in their room or sitting in the living room and talk about their school, their friends. 10 to 15 minutes each day is more than enough. Although everybody will surprise 10, 15 minutes, that's all you're asking? Yes, because they don't talk even five minutes in weeks. So 10 to 15 minutes. That's first thing. Second thing is that at least once in a month, try to have a family gathering, not extended family, just three, four children have a picnic or go out somewhere, half an hour, one hour. It gives them a feeling of belonging, a relationship. In addition to the personal involvement parents can have in their kids' lives, people can also work against Satanism at the community level. Many schools and organizations now offer seminars on Satanism. Some communities have gone even farther than that. Recruitment is a major part of Satanism, but it's one of the most instantly denied things. By... And yet it's such a problem that even on our public school campuses, now school boards are having to take direct action against it. I'm reading from the Carl Sandburg High School 1989-1990 Student Parent Handbook. On page 29, it deals with policy. And I want you to hear this. The Board of Education hereby finds that the presence of Satanism and related activities has surfaced in society and that such practices, when present or urged upon other students, cause material interference within a public high school district in that such practices foster anti-social values and attitudes and endangers the health, safety, and welfare of students. Carl Sandburg High School is the number three school academically in the United States. It's in Chicago. Now listen. No student shall engage in any Satanism-related uh, activity, including, but not limited to the following. Number one, soliciting others for membership in any Satanic group or participation in any Satanic-related ritual or practice, inciting other students to act with physical violence upon any other person or living thing. Thirdly, they are not permitted to wear use, distribute, display, or sell any clothing, jewelry, emblem, badge, sign, or other item which is commonly associated with the affiliation with or practice of Satanism. What I'm trying to say to you is these three areas of recruitment 
high school campuses, military bases, daycare centers. I'm most obviously connected with, first, the high school campus, and then secondly, the military base. My point, though, is that so much activity is now taking place that school boards are having to enact policies in how to deal with it. This isn't relegated to the big city of Chicago only. Here's something you should see from a town in our community, Arlington, Texas. Well, this Halloween, you might see a scarecrow in the halls of Arlington schools, but you won't see kids wearing scary costumes. The school district is banning skulls, witches, brooms, and the like because of parent concerns that some Halloween costumes can be linked to devil worship and satanic cults. Channel 4's Ken Caps has more on that story. Playful screams on Arlington playgrounds mean back to school and recess. But there won't be any shrieks or screams by these kids clothed in goblin garb this Halloween. Ghosts and skeletons and other scary characters are expelled. And when you see children in elementary levels coming with Freddy Krueger and their fingers have the knives or whatever he has and the grossness of the costumes, we thought we can do better than that. Atherton principal Shirley Cole has her kids decorating a school display area with pressed leaves and a stuffed scarecrow. Autumn, not Halloween, will be emphasized. Kids in Arlington will still dress up on October 31st, but they'll be playing the parts of their favorite book characters. October is book month. Which will do two things. It'll give those children an opportunity to dress in costume, but it also will encourage them to read. Satan exacts an agonizing toll in the lives of those who are trapped and in the lives of those who help them escape. Yet those we have interviewed expressed a profound hope for those who want to escape. If you have your rehabilitation and your counselors, but it's going to take something stronger in some of these cases. And a good old-fashioned prayer meeting won't hurt anything. There's hope for me. There's hope for everyone. I don't care what the situation. So the number one importance is the cohesive relationship among the family members. Then the kid who has some belief in God, I think he's much more protected. Because there's a God and because there's a cross, there's hope. And that's not a second-handed um, hope. I had a choice to make, and I chose life. I knew I was about to die and that I was going to hell. What the Satanist is looking for in the, in the long term, he's looking for God. He's looking for that thing that he can worship. And until he finds it, until he gets reconciliation with what he's looking for, then there is no freedom.